وَإِن تَعْجَبْ فَعَجَبُ قَوْلُهُمْ أَيْذَا كُنَّا تُرَابًا أَيْنَا لَفِي خَلْقٍ جَدِيدٍ أُولَئِكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ وَأُولَئِكَ الْأَغْلَالُ فِي أَعْنَاقِهِمْ وَأُولَئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Once again, I'm joined on the hot seat by Ustad Muhammad Tim Humble and Ustad Abdul Rahman Hassan. Jazakallah khairan for joining me, to the both of you. Jazakallah khairan. Barakallah fi fahmin us. So we've come to the final part of this trilogy that we're doing on the world of the unseen. So previously we've spoken about jinn possession, we've spoken about magic, and now we come to the topic of evil eye. So I want to get straight into it, inshallah. Again, very simple, generic question at the start. What exactly is evil eye? Okay. بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا ما بعد. First of all, we know that the evil eye is something that is true. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, and the hadith is in Sahih Muslim from the hadith of Abdullah ibn Abbas رضي الله عنهما. He said, العين حق. ولو كان شيء سابق القدر سبقته العين. وإذا استغسلت فغسلوا. So we know that this is something true. And the reason I started with that, rather than talking about what this concept is before we just get into that, is I think that it's really important, it's really profound the way the Prophet ﷺ said those words, al-ayn wa haq. What we're about to talk about is something real. So when we get into the definition of it, I think it's important to bear in mind that this is something that is, is real and true and has a profound effect and that if something were to overtake the divine decree it would be the evil eye so it's something it's something true and that's something which has a profound effect i personally like the way that al-imam ibn al-qayyim uh, rahimahullah ta'ala uh, describes it and he describes it in many different ways he has a lot of statements uh, describing it but he describes it like an arrow he said فَالَّذِي يَخْرُجُ مِنْ عَيْنِ الْعَائِنِ سَهْمٌ معنوي. إذا صادف البدن لا وقاية له أثر فيه وإلا لم ينفذ السهم بل ربما رد على صاحبه كالسهم الحسي سواء I think the way he describes it is very beautiful He says it's like an arrow that comes out at like, an, like a, a, an arrow which isn't a physical arrow but something that behaves like an arrow that comes out from the person who gives the evil eye and if it strikes the body of someone that doesn't have protection, it causes an effect uh, upon them. And it, otherwise, it doesn't affect that person. And perhaps it would even come back upon the person who gave it like a real arrow might, you know, bounce off and fall back exactly the same way. And he also said, وَأَصْلُهُ مِنْ إِعْجَابِ الْآعِنِ بِالشَّيْءِ The core of it is, is that the person giving the evil eye is impressed by uh, something then after that this person has he said his like his corrupt and wicked soul causes that imp being impressed by something and amazed by something he causes it to have an effect upon the person that he's impressed with or that he is uh, amazed with Sheikh, did you have some things to add on? نعم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد The illnesses that we go through uh, as the children of Adam is two types So the first marad is أمراض قلبية Illnesses that happen to the heart And أمراض Illnesses that uh, happen to the physical side, the body Um the amrad al-qalbiya is either shahawat or shubuhat, doubts or desires. I mean, that's the best translation, sah. Shahawat is desires, and shubuhat is doubts that. So these are illnesses that the heart go through, and that's not what we're really talking about here, even that though um, some of the scholars, they strongly bonded between the illnesses of the heart with the illness of the body that they, there's a strong relationship between the two 
Like in the one we're focusing here and talking about here mainly is Amrad Badaniya, like the physical side. And Ain is one of those things that happen to the physical side. Like that's why Hadith Ibn Abbas in Sahih, uh, Sahih Muslim, it um, clearly states that the Ain is Haq, it's true, it's real. So it physically has a physical existence. It's not something metaphorical, it's not something that just is not seen, it's actually seen. This person is affected. And when you look at the ta'rifat of the ulama like Al-Khattabi and Ibn Al-Qayyim here and you look at Ibn Al-Jawzi and other imma, you tend to find they use the word Al-Ain and even the word itself Al-Ain. Some people think it's just you have to see the person you're doing the Ain to. And that's not really the only, that's not necessarily the case. A person can give a person an Ain just merely hearing about them. And that's why Allah said in the ayah, وَإِنْ يَكَادُوا الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَيُزْلِقُونَكَ بِأَبْصَارِمْ لَمَّا سَمِعُوا الذِّكْرَ وَيَقُولُونَ إِنَّهُ لَمَجْنُونَ Allah says, when the disbelievers were close to, لا يزلقونك, to make you slip, Muhammad. لما سمعوا الذكرى, when they heard the truth. So they didn't see him, but they heard it. So those even who heard it can have an effect on a person by just merely hearing it. So the term al meaning seeing is min babi taghlib. It is generally the case, majority of the times, but it's not only the case. It can actually happen from just merely hearing about someone. I mean, I thought that was important to put that there yeah. as well. So when we talk about this effect that you mentioned, Ustad Tim, what exactly are we talking about here? So what I look at Ustad Uthman's slope, for example, and I'm impressed by it, and suddenly it disintegrates, or suddenly he finds holes in it, or he puts it in the wash and it changes colour. Like, what exactly mm. are we talking about here? So here, first of all, we have to say that not everyone who has this amazement and jealousy affects other people with it. Uh, jealousy and amazement in, in a negative sense are always harmful to the person who gives them. And that's why, or one of the reasons why Allah said, وَمِنْ شَرِّ حَاسِدٍ إِذَا حَسَدٍ Because al-hasad, it has shar, shurur, any evils in it. And Allah chose to mention it among, among the most greatest of the evil or the greatest of the evils from those things which Allah min sharima that Allah Azza wa Jal created. Because jealousy and indeed that kind of amazement with something that that is, uh, what's the word, that is accompanied by a, a nafs which is khabitha, like a, a corrupt soul and an and a, and a evil soul, is harmful to the person who does it. However, there are some people who along with causing themselves harm, and causing harm to their hearts and causing harm to their good deeds and causing harm to their relationship with Allah Azza wa Jal cause physical harm to manifest itself uh, in the person that they are uh, that they are uh, speaking about or that they are they've heard about or that they are amazed with now i personally feel that when you gather together the ahadith and perhaps we're going to talk about the uh, the uh, hadith of sahal that is in it's in Muqtabir Imam Malik, it's in Musnad Imam Ahmed and others, inshallah, we can talk about that in a moment. But there are different sort of uh, situations. One is that a person can be jealous or can be amazed by a particular characteristic of a person, like their hair or their thobe or something that they possess. And bear in mind, it's not the thobe you're jealous of. You don't wish that you could be a thobe. It's the person's ownership of it that the jealousy comes with. And that's why I asked one of the mashayikh and I said to him that, Sheikh, I want to understand better, you know, because this issue of someone being jealous of the car, they're not, they're not jealous of the car, right? They're jealous of that owner's relationship with it, the fact that he has ownership of it. So here it could affect the person in that specific thing. And this is quite common. So for example, someone gives ayin on someone's hair and their hair begins to fall or their hair begins to, uh, it, it doesn't have the same quality that it had before. Or it could be that the person becomes generally sick in their whole body, especially if someone is jealous of something like the person's skin or the, or the person's whole body, for example. Or even generally so, it can strike a person in different ways. And if you think of the example Ibn al-Qayyim gave, it's such a good example of shooting an arrow at somebody. Because you can shoot an arrow at somebody and miss. You can shoot an arrow at somebody and the arrow can be deflected by the person's armor. Or it can cause them some harm, but it can be less than the harm that you intended. You aimed for the heart, but you struck the arm, for example. 
So it's a very, very good example, the example of the arrow, because it shows that how it can affect people in different ways. But it can affect people up to a very, very significant effect to the point that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam described the person, uh, described the person of, uh, you, like the person who is killing, like he said, uh, Would one of you wish to kill his brother? So the issue is not a, a small thing where it's just we're talking about his thobe changing color and it could reach a person to the point that a person dies from it. So this is a voluntary action. That's what I'm understanding from you. Like you voluntarily shoot an arrow somewhere. What do you mean? Explain. Me. Explain. Yeah. Like, like for example, for me to have, uh, the, to me to inflict someone with the evil eye, it's like I have to be intending that they get the evil eye or not. Or can I just be amazed? Mm. Like for my child, for example, I don't wish any harm for them, but I just look at them and think, wow. I mean, if you look at the Sheikh statement he mentioned, it, there's a strong bond built between Al Ain and Al Hasid. And that's when, of course, the person intends to, you know, Hasid itself, jealousy. This is something. Uh, so, what's the difference between the two? Let's... So, uh, f so, let me explain for both the first. So, the first one is Al Hasid. And the second one is the issue of. Um, Al-Ijab, you are fascinated with something. And this is not necessarily you intending anything evil, but as Imma uh, and uh, Ibn al-Qayyim mentioned it, I came across um, a statement by, uh, I saw Ibn al-Qayyim, say it, yeah. and, I, and I came across a statement, I think it was Ibn al-Daqiq al-Aid, when he came on the explanation of the hadith, ala ma yaqtul ahadukum akhah, he mentioned that the ijab here can be a mother to her own child without her, her intending evil for the child, but she just didn't say what she should have said when she saw that which amazed her, you know. And so here what comes with it is that nafs which is khabitha, that, 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 that evil comes from. And the other one is hasad, jealousy. And so called, here you said the nafs khabitha, like the mother to her daughter, she has nafs khabitha? No, not, not necessarily to harm the child. Okay. But every in, the nafs, of course the ulama divide it into three. وَمَا أُبَرِّئُ نَفْسِي إِنَّ النَّفْسَ الْأَمَارَةُ بِالسُوء and nafs that's we, within us that commands us evil. Second one is um, a nafs which is lawama, la uqsimu biyawm al qiyamah, wa la uqsimu bin nafsi lawama. And the third one, Allah tabarak wa ta'ala says, ya ayatuhan nafsul mutma'inna, irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatan mardiyah. So sometimes the nafs itself can have an evil, uh, evilness in it, without intending you to actually do it to that person. Mm -hmm. That's why we were commanded to say particular things so that it prevents all of this from taking place. So here perhaps we can say that the worst kind of Ayn and Allah Azza wa knows best is the one where the person deliberately has, has a conscious and deliberate feeling of evil and desire for that person to lose what they have. Mm -hmm. But that a person simply not, a, not sticking to the commands of Allah Azza wa and the commands that the Messenger Sallallahu has given, that can, can also have evil consequences upon uh, a person, even if it isn't a, a conscious and deliberate uh, effort to do so, it still comes from something wrong. It doesn't come from something good. It comes from a nafs that has a fl flaws and, and faults in it that the person is not doing what they are supposed to do. To the point that Ibn al-Qayyim not only mentioned uh, a person afflicting their child, but I found also that he mentioned a person afflicting uh, themselves as well. That a person uh, could potentially afflict وقد, he said وقد he said a person could even give ayn to himself subhanallah mm -hmm. because of a person's not following the proper procedure and the proper islamic etiquettes when feeling amazed and proud by, or, or by by something so let's talk about that now what is the proper islamic etiquettes when feeling when seeing something that impresses you or amazes you mm. so this brings us to a point which I think is very important as well, is that this is an illness. Like that now this person gets afflicted with like this I now has afflicted this individual. And so what it does is that this person becomes sick from it. And we know from the famous hadith of the Prophet that there's no illness that happens to be that except that it has a cure. The one who knows it knows it, and the one who doesn't know it doesn't know it. So ayn is an illness. Like when it happens to the individual, it's an illness. It comes sometimes from the angle of ijab, fascination and amazement with something. And sometimes it even comes from hasad. And hasad, the scholars, they say it's uh, two types. Hasad, which is mahmud and that which is madhmoom. Blameworthy and praiseworthy. 
The famous one, famous one is that the Prophet Sallallahu said in the hadith, لا حسد إلا في ثنتين There is no hasid except in two things. رجل آتاه الله مالا فسلطه على هلكته A person who Allah gave him wealth and he's taking that wealth and he's spending it in, in, in the cause of Allah Azza wa Jalla. And also وَرَجُلٌ آتَاهُ اللَّهُ عِلْمًا A man who Allah gave him knowledge, he gave him the Qur'an, he gave him the Sunnah, he gave him knowledge of the religion, and he's there teaching the people. And so you look at that and you say, oh Allah, I, I would like to have that. But it's not what you want that person to lose. You want it that khair to be for that person, but you'd also want it for yourself. This hasad is it's, it's praiseworthy. Okay. The second form of hasad uh, is the one that you want this person to lose it. And this is where it automatically falls into the madmoom, the blameworthy one. Where you see a good trait in someone And you want that good trait to be taken away from that person And that has two levels A level where it's I want it, that person to lose it And I want it for myself And that's evil and it's bad um, The second one is that you want the person to lose it And not necessarily get it for yourself And that's even worse As long as this person doesn't have it I'm happy I just don't want this person to have it And that's even worse so these characteristics of al-hasid, of course, is, is that which uh, Iblis had towards Adam alayhi salam. So it's a characteristic that started from him. And Allah also mentioned it for the, uh, the, the disbelievers that, that, that they have for the Muslims. That the disbelievers, they wish, this is what they want. Uh, they want to take you back after your faith and belief of Allah. Azza wa Jalla. They want you to believe. They want you to be like them. They want both of you part them and all of you to be misguided. So, uh, mm. uh, to answer your question yeah. on on the, the issue that we came to, so not necessarily the cure, but is there so, a prevention? Yeah. So, uh, in this hadith, and let's let's talk about this hadith of uh, of Sahih Muhayyib that he said uh, that he did ghusl at a place called Al Kharrar, and he took off his uh, his uh, clothing. Or his, he took off his jubba, his cloak That he was wearing And there was someone called Amir ibn Rabi'ah Who was looking at him And Sahel was a man Who, who had he, he was fair skinned And his skin was very He had very beautiful skin So Amir ibn Rabi'ah said He said I have not seen He said He said Wala jilda he said that I have not seen skin like this, not even the skin of a virgin. And Sahel fell down on the spot. And when he fell down on the spot and his condition grew worse, they took him to the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they told him, uh, when, and when he came to him, we said, then we mentioned the hadith which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, he said, ma yaqtulu ahadukum akha. He, then he said, Alla barrakta. He said, would you not have said would you not have invoked barakah for him? I would you not have said, may Allah bless you, or was this effect? Now in this, I, I did a little bit of research and because this issue came up about the exact sirah, the exact phrase that you should use uh, here in order to seek barakah for someone. And many of the, the ulama, when they mentioned this, they said it was sufficient to mention, to return the blessing to Allah Azza wa Jalla. Sufficient for you to return the blessing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And to say that this is from Allah Like somebody saying Allah or something like that But the wording of the hadith is to invoke And this, and, in, and Allah Azza wa knows best the, the safer what is aslam Is that you follow the wording of the hadith And you invoke barakah for that person Like saying for example Allahumma barik Or barakallahu fika May Allah bless you Or may Allah give you blessings Or May Allah bless you in it. Barakallahu laka fi. May Allah give you blessings in it, or something like that, where you invoke the barakah, and that's the wording of the hadith. And some of them, they use the evidence. They stedelu bil ayah. They use the ayah in Surah Al Kahf uh, regarding uh, the person when they enter the garden, and he say, Masha Allah la quwwata illa billah. Uh, but here, the hadith itself, this hadith that is in, as we said, it's in Musnad Imam Ahmad, uh, Nasa'in al Kubara ibn Hibban, and the Muwatta of Imam Malik. That here the wording is to invoke barakah for the person. And that of course includes returning the blessing to Allah Azza wa Jal. In I saying that that blessing came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and asking Allah Azza wa Jal to bless that person. And that removes all of the 
the ijab, the amazement, and all of the hasad if it exists from the person's heart. Did you have? No. Um, so what we can do is we can divide the cure for the ayn into two. We can, uh, one is the prevention, which is the asal, uh, because Arabs and, and even in the English language, al wiqayatu khayru min al ilaj. Prevention is better than cure. So it's aslan, you shouldn't have to see your brother or your sister suffer. You should say this at the beginning when you see something that amazes you. You should say, Allahumma barik. Rabbi barakallahu laka. Uh, you bring, you know, you bring the statement into whatever amazes you and fascinates you. Of course, if the, this, the majority of the ulama, they mention, rather Shaykh Islam Taymiyyah, actually uh, the risale that was compiled by Sheikh Mashur Hassan on the jinn, uh, the aqwal of Ibn Taymiyyah regarding jinn, that he took from his majmu'ah and you know, Jam' al-Masalik and other books like that. Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, he says that this generally comes from a person who is fascinated. The hadith of Sahal showed that he was fascinated. And so he would say, Allahumma barik, amma barak Allahu lak. Because he didn't intend evil, aslan. He didn't want you to suffer. He didn't want this person to be afflicted with something evil. He said it out of fascination. Like in the one who's hasid, he won't say that. So he doesn't want good for you and he's not intending good for you. So um, the second cure is after the problem has happened. So if you've been fascinated with something and you saw that this person, uh, something happened to them, the Prophet Sallallahu guided us to um, do wudu for the person. So you actually do wudu and whatever is left for, over from the water, that water that is poured over the person or they shower with that water. Mm. And the Prophet Sallallahu told us that if that water, if the person requests you is, can you give me water? The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then give. Like if you're questioning and you're asked for it, you should give. give. And the Amr of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the science of Usul al-Fiqh we study is that, uh, that the commandments of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and what he instructs us to do, it shows obligation. So if the person asks you to do wudu for them, you have to do it for them. It's not an issue of whether, you know, uh, um, I didn't do anything wrong Wallahi I didn't Even if you think You didn't do anything wrong This qalb of this brother And this person's heart You have to bring Tumatnina to it Okay So here Just an extra point What the Sheikh said We're talking about Classifying down the cures now Into the prevention And the cure And uh, the cure That the that uh, Dr. Rahman mentioned Regarding the, the ghusl And regarding the wudu This is a cure Which is used When the person is known or the person is suspected. And I think it's very profound in the hadith of, uh, of Sahin Munhaif, this hadith regarding what happened uh, to him, uh, that in this hadith, the Prophet wasallam indicated or he uh, asked them, where is it? I can't find this one here. No, no, no. There's a wording. There's a wording I'm looking for. Do you remember in Arabic, Sheikh? Hal tatahimun. That's what is. Yeah. That I, can't, I know. Yeah. Okay. So we just resume on that point. So in some of the narration of the hadith, the Prophet said, Hal Do you accuse anyone of this? So here, either the person is known, or either there is at least ghalabatul like there is some kind of preponderant uh, belief that this person has done this. But what do you do also when there is no, we don't know at all who did this. We have no idea whatsoever. For this, we have another hadith. This is in the hadith of Asma bint Umais. Uh, and uh, the reference uh, for the hadith in Ahmed and in At-Tirmidhi, that she said regarding the children of Ja'far, that the children of Ja'far have been afflicted by the evil eye. Shall we not recite ruqya for them? Shall we not recite ruqya for them? And the Prophet Sallallahu said, yes. For if anything were to overtake the divine decree, it would be the evil eye. So here, what we, where we take this hadith, is this hadith upon the person that we don't know. The children are, are sick. It appears that they, their sickness is not something which has a medical cause. And we believe these children from the sign, from looking at them, they've been touched by the evil eye. And therefore now, if we don't know who to ask and we don't have anyone that we make tuhma or ittiham of, now then we go to the mas'ala of ar-ruqya al-shara'iyya of of Ruqya Quranic therapy or Quranic healing. Mm -hmm. So I definitely want to talk about Ruqya Shariya in a lot more detail, inshallah. But just before we move off evil eye, I know we're doing the world of the unseen, but with the previous kind of topics we've covered, jinn possession, for example, 
we accept the existence of jinn. Another topic like magic, we can see that, you know, people might be blowing on knots or have hair, like the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu that we took earlier. But evil eye, what, 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 is, what is causing this? Like, how does this happen? I look at the microphone and I, I'm amazed by it and suddenly the microphone crashes to the ground. Like, what? how does this happen? What is the cause for this? I, I, it just doesn't seem to add up rationally here. I think as we've spoken about in the very beginning of this uh, of this three part uh, series about the importance of believing in the unseen, uh, we spoke about the statement of Allah غيب, those who believe in the unseen, and how belief in the unseen is a fundamental characteristic of the believers and a fundamental characteristic of the people who are successful. Now we have a statement from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Al Ain wa Haq that I could that, that not just mean the truth that the consequences. So for example, I see someone's car and I'm amazed by it. It doesn't mean just by looking at it the car is going to crash to the ground. I could come back that night and scratch the car. Al Ain wa Haq. The consequences of my jealousy is true. Why can't we just interpret it that way? Does that make more sense? I mean, first of all, Sheikh Tim mentioned, Sheikh Muhammad mentioned something very important, which is that you know, the unseen is something we are commanded to surrender and to believe in. Allah says, فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ فِي مَا شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُوا فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَرَجًا مِمَّا قَضِيْ وَيُسَلِّمُ تَسْلِيمًا This is the point I want from the ayah, which is that you surrender to it. You see? Um, and so the ayah, فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ The hukum of Allah is two types. The first hukum is hukum which is shar'i and hukum which is kawni. Hukm is that Allah's, the Quran and the Sunnah are ahkam from Allah Azza wa Jalla. We need to surrender to that. We need to believe in it. Whenever an ayah tells us something, when a hadith tells us something, we believe in it. We also have to believe in the universal things Allah does, subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can't reject them. Things that Allah wa ta'ala has established. And those two ayat, I mean, those two hukm, ahkam which are shari'iyah and ahkam which are kawniyah, both lead to Allah's existence, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they both affirm Allah wa Taala, His ability, His knowledge, His infinite knowledge, His infinite ability, Subhanahu wa Taala. So this issue of the Ain affecting people is not only just ahkam shari'a. I mean, we can see it from the Hadith of the Prophet I, I recited the ayah in Surah Al-Qalam, "Wa yakadu ladina kafaru la yuzliqunak," and many other portion of the Quran. I'm a Hadith you can find it in. You also see it when we in the world that we're living in today, you see actual people being affected by someone looking at them. Or well, can't just be a coincidence. Here again, I, I want to just interject with the hadith that we mentioned of uh, Sahih al Hanith. This hadith, it's very the hadith is very clear. The companion simply said that I've never seen skin like this, and he dropped to the ground. And he didn't come back later on, and you know scratch him or throw him down or something like that. The reality is we, we have to take these ahadith together and Prince will come back to again, Iman bil ghaib and taking the sharia as a whole, taking all of the ahadith together. And again, not rejecting things because they just don't make sense to us. The reality is the ghaib, generally speaking, is something which the the intellect doesn't have a place in, even though the Quran and the Sunnah don't contradict the sound intellect. But the reality is that the intellect just can't stand up to matters relating to the unseen because you just don't have things to compare it to. You don't have a basis of, of principles or ideas or concepts through which you can understand how this works. This works on a level that is outside of our knowledge and understanding, but it's sufficient for us that as Sadiq al Mastuq, the one who is truthful in what he said and the one who is believed for what he said told us that it is the truth and that's why we started the very first thing that i mentioned to you is al -ayn -haq. the ayn is the, is the truth because it's something which if you take it from a purely logical perspective you would say well i don't really see the scientific basis or the logical basis for me to believe in this but we see the shara'i basis to believe in it the islamic is, basis to is there it. any uh, dispute over the hadith with a companion or another companion and he fell to the ground is there any dispute over its authenticity could be. I mean, I'm not going to say there isn't, but like in Miman la yu'awwalu ilayhi, someone who won't, we won't give consideration to. The fan, the people of the field and the people who are grounded in the science are saying it's authentic. So we don't look at Mu'allimi, he has a very, very powerful statement of his. He said, Thumma yati min ba'di dhalika uwayrun wa kusayrun wa thalitu laysa fihi khayrun. 
like we we have like Ahmed Muhammad authenticated his hadith we have Ibn Abi Hatim we have Abu Zur'a we have Ibn Sikit who authenticated it Suyuti has a risala even on it a little juz so we have these aima who we say like you know they know this field and they, I mean they 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 know this science mutaqaddimin al mutaakhirin so if the, if a Uwayr or Qusayr or Thalithu laysa fi khair comes and says something about the hadith we'll just say okay I mean hadayani this is he's just his speech and his whatever he wants to say he can say no problem mm. and even you you know have to you have to look at this point which is important you can't push something based on uh, possibilities you can't say what about pos- this is possible uh, i mean everything in this world there's a possibility there is a possibility we can't eliminate possibilities from just about every situation in our lives how do you know you're here right now the possibility there's a possibility we're dreaming inauthentic mm-hmm. no the possibility of this all not being ain right. for example a right. scratch on the car you know what about if there's a possibility that this happened what about this possibility that happened right. i could say okay, what about the possibility that you and i and sheikh tim are not sitting here right now it's all a dream you know it's, it could be a possibility we could be dreaming could not be a reality so th- things like that don't push away certainty waliqinu la yuzalu bishak you can't remove certainty which is a statement of the prophet alayhi salatu salam quranic evidences you can't remove it with speculations possibilities mm. And then more than that, let's talk about some of the companions who narrated this. This is not only narrated in the hadith we mentioned, it's also narrated from Ibn Abbas, it's narrated from Aisha, from Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, it's narrated from Umm Salama, from Jabir ibn Abdullah, from, uh, from Urwa who narrated uh, from uh, Umm Salama, uh, from uh, Ruwayf, as we said, Jabir ibn Abdullah. All of these companions narrating <laughs> totally different. It's not they're narrating the same event that might be, you know, they're all narrating different times in which the Prophet ﷺ said something about to establish the evil eye, the evil eye is the truth, or uh, the uh, dua to save you from the evil eye, or Jibreel, uh, the narration about Jibreel, uh, seeking refuge from the evil of every envious eye, and so on. This is narrated by so many of the companions in so many different ways. I don't think there's any basis for you to take one particular hadith and say, this hadith, you know, doesn't isn't authentic or whatever. Come to the other 10, 20, you know, so on. It's very difficult to argue that uh, regarding the evil eye. And it's something that we should submit to and accept, even if we don't understand the uh, the mechanism by which that actually happens. Because that is something, it's part of the ghaib. And the ghaib, you only have what Allah Azza wa Jal told you and what his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told you. You don't have anything additional to that. So all you can do is to take what you have been given, which we have been given the reality of the Ayn. We've been given the protection from giving Ayn to other people. We've been given dua to protect yourself from it happening to you. And we've been given the concept of Ruqya Shari'a for treating it and the treating with the wudu and the ghusl and so on. That's sufficient. You know, the Sharia gives us everything we need. As for the things that we don't need that are not important to us or that are not critical for our understanding, then at the end of the day, if we haven't been told about all of the tafasil and the details, then that's not that's not critical to us. We've been told it's a reality. We've been told how to protect, how to cure it, how to seek refuge from it, and so on. That's what that's those are what the people need. Okay, let's talk about ruqya sharia now. Let's go on to that. So, what exactly is ruqya? Uh, ruqya is to seek refuge in Allah wa Taala for a particular individual, for you to do it for yourself as well. It's to seek refuge in Allah wa Taala, and the way that you do it by seeking refuge in Allah is three main ways. Number one is uh, Quran by reciting the words of Allah wa Taala, because the Quran is the speech of Allah. Uh, Allah says in the Quran, "وَإِنْ أَحَدٌ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ اسْتَجَارَكَ فَأَجِرُهُ حَتَّى يَسْمَعَ كَلَامَ اللَّهِ." The Quran is the speech of Allah. So you read verses of the Quran and the Quran is a cue. Allah says, وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءَ And the word مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ as Ibn al-Qayyim mentions in his kitab الدَّاءُ وَالدَّوَاءُ It is not تَبْعُضِيَةَ Meaning it doesn't mean that some of the Quran is a cure. It's actually بَيَانُ جِنْسِيَةَ بَيَانُ لِلْجِنْ Sorry. It's actually just saying that the Quran is a cure for us. Just like Allah said in Surah to, uh, Surah to, لم يكن الذين كفروا من أهل الكتاب الله سورة بينا الله تبارك وتعالى he said إن الذين كفروا من أهل الكتاب he is not all تبعذي as well so it's not some of the 
ان الذين كفروا من اهل الكتاب اهل الكتاب او كفار so we can't use the word min here as tab'idiya so when we use the Quran the whole Quran is a cure also Allah said in another ayah ya ayyuhan nasu qad ja'atkum wa'idatun min rabbikum wa shifa'u lima fi sudur this is the ayah that I wanted to bring to you so when we do tafsir al-Quran bil Quran the ayah you mentioned the first ayah was obviously a general ayah that talks about the Quran being a shifa when we look at the ayah in surah Yunus like you just mentioned now lima fi sudur the Quran is a cure, lima fi sudur. Doesn't that show that Allah is now restricting it? And he's actually saying it's a cure for the things that are in your heart, i.e. ignorance, um, kufr, shirk, mm-hmm. all of these kind of actions, all these kind of things that stay mm-hmm. in the heart. Mm-hmm. It's not necessarily a cure like I'm sure you guys are going to say for a headache or for a scratch on your hand or for mental illnesses. Okay, it's good that you asked that question, to be honest. Um I haven't really done a good research on this particular topic personally, but this is one thing that, subhanAllah, if I did look at a while back, or recently I was looking at a risala I was reading, the ayah where Allah wa Ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal nasu qad ja'akum mawridatu min rabbikum wa shifa'u lima fi sudur. It's a cure for the person's nafs. And alhamdulillah, we mentioned at the beginning of the discussion of what ayn is and what it means, the nafs of people can affect another person. So the Quran is a cure for that evil nafs that's within us. It does cure it. So it's a preventative cause for it. And Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimullah, and a Sayyid, uh, he has a kitab called Ikhtilaf al-Ulama, wa atharuhu ala ara'i al-fiqhiyya, something like that. It's called a Sayyid al-Batrusi, rahimullah, something like that. I mean, his name is, he pointed this out, that the nafs that the individuals have in them that affect the ayn of a person, so you're affecting a person by your jab. We mentioned that it means that you're fascinated with something. And so your evil nafs has an effect on this person here. The Quran is a cure for that evil nafs of yours. And it's not only a cure for that. The other ayah explains that the Quran is also a cure for the nafs ibtida'an because that's the asal. Sheikh Tim, do you have anything to add on that mm. point? Yeah. So there's actually two uh, points I wanted to add. Is it, If we took here, we can just step back a little bit sure. because we were still talking about the definition of ruqya here. And I wanted to quote to you from al Hafid ibn Hajar. It's also mentioned by Al-Nawawi and others. But al Hafid ibn Hajar, he mentioned the ijma' on this. That ruqya, if it has three shurut, then it is a sh- ruqya shara'iya. It is a, a shara'i, a, a, an Islamic ruqya. Ruqya in general, the word in general refers to these words that are said. I think perhaps in English sometimes we call it incantations or words that are said. And this is something that existed in the time of Jahiliyyah. So it existed prior to Islam that people had certain words they would read in order to effect a cure by the permission of Allah upon uh, a sick person. And uh, certain people became known for this in, even in the time of, of Jahiliyyah and we'll come to that hadith in that regard. Uh, but here, what we want to say is that what al Hafid ibn Hajar uh, rahimahullah ta'ala mentioned, and he mentioned the ijma' on this. First of all, and تَكُونَ بِكَلَامِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَىٰ وَبِأَسْمَاهِ وَصِفَاتِهِ That this ruqya takes place using the na- the speech of Allah or Allah's names and attributes. Secondly, وَبِاللِّسَانٍ uh, بِاللِّسَانِ الْعَرَبِي أَوْ بِمَا يُعْرَفُ مَعْنَاهُ مِنْ غَيْرِهِ Or that it's by an Arabic tongue or that which its words are known. So it's not like words that are people don't know what the words are or, or don't understand what the words are. And thirdly, أن يعتقد وأن يعتقد أن الرقية لا تؤثر بذاتها بل بذات الله تعالى فهي جائزة بالاتفاق. That if this happens and it's permissible, it's permissible by اتفاق, this uh, is similar to this, words equivalent to this. Al-Hafid ibn Hajar mentioned ijma' upon it and now we brought it in his explanation of Sahih Muslim and others among the scholars who mentioned the ittifaq of the ulama upon these three things. So first of all, this Ijma' in itself also is a response uh, to this issue that uh, it's only for what is in the hearts. But more than that, the ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Because remember, we understand the Quran in the light of the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the actions of the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum. There are numerous, numerous ahadith of the Sahaba using, and in fact, I would venture to say the majority of the examples of ruqya among the Sahaba were for what we would call physical, medical illnesses, snake bites, scorpion stings, fever, and so on. I will just give you an example from Abu Sa'id uh, al-Khudri, 
and the hadith is very long, so I just want to uh, to summarize that there was a that they passed by uh, some they passed by a tribe from among the tribes of the Arabs, and their leader was stung, and one of them said uh, to go to this group which contained Abu Sa'id al Khudri. So if we come to the the shahid from it, um, uh, that uh, he recited upon them. وَيَقْرَ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ فَكَأَنَّمَا نُشِطَ مِنْ عِقَالِ It's as though he was freed from chains. فَانْطَلَقَ يَمْشِي وَمَا بِهِ قَالَبَ He left like the person got up walking as though nothing had happened uh, to him. And they went to the Prophet ﷺ and the Prophet ﷺ said وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ أَنَّهَا رُقْيَ What will make you know that it's a ruqya? And he said قَدْ أَصَبْتُمْ You did the right thing. And the hadith is, is a long hadith. Uh, the hadith is narrated by Bukhari and Muslim and others, uh, and it has various narrations and various different uh, any examples from it. But the key thing we've got here is you, we've got ruqya sharia being used for somebody who has what is a known medical complaint. It's a sting, scorpion sting or a snake bite. Uh, someone who is ladiq has been bitten. It's not something that is is necessarily any from the jinn or from the or from the world of the unseen. You have examples of the fever. You have the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi entering upon uh, Aisha radiallahu anha and a woman is there who is uh, treating her and he says, Ali jiha bi kitabillah, treat her with the book of Allah. The hadith in this are so numerous and that they teach us that this ayah is not restricted to the matters of the heart, even though the matters of the heart are the greatest of matters and it's what's more important, the, the safety and the health of your heart or the safety and the health of your, you know, one of your limbs, your finger or your arm or whatever it might be. So the ruqya sharia is that you seek refuge in Allah tabarak wa ta'ala and you do the seeking or, uh, refuge in Allah tabarak wa ta'ala through uh, reciting the Qur'an. So the person reads the Qur'an and there are many evidences to support this. Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, he says, وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ we have sent down from the Qur'an uh, a cure, the Qur'an in its totality. Some of the uh, people of innovation, they try to say that the word uh, min here in this verse is tab'idiyah. So some of the verses are being said to be cures. But we reject that. We say that the min doesn't always mean some. Uh, like in the verse in Surah Al-Bayyinah, where Allah says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ, uh, uh, إن الذين كَفَرُوا مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ uh, So the Ahlul Kitab are all kuffar. They're not Muslims. So to say that the min here means ba'd, tab'idiyah, is incorrect. So it's, as Ibn al-Qayyim mentioned in his kitab, Da'u wa dawa it's bayanu lil-jins, which means that the whole entire Qur'an in its essence is a cure. And another verse, Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, he says, subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya ayu al-nasu qad ja'atkum maw'idhatum min rabbikum wa shifa'u lima fi sudur. Allah is mentioning, subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he has sent down cure for mankind. So the Quran is a cure for the two types of illnesses that I mentioned, uh, Amradul Qulub and Amradul Abdan. It kills the hearts and it also kills the body. And the heart is the foundation. Uh, also what the Ruqya is, is that um, Allah's names and attributes. We know Allah wa ta'ala has names and all of the names of Allah have meaning in it and they have characteristics in it. And the belief of Ahl Sunnah is Allah's names are that Allah's names are not just mere names. They are names that have within them characteristics and attributes and meanings that are taken from it. Uh, so the names of Allah and his characteristics are a cure, a ruqya. So how does that manifest itself in practicality then? Say I've got a scorpion sting on my hand. I can just repeat one of Allah's names. Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahman. No, it's uh, one of the biggest examples for it. It's of course, it's the speech of Allah wa Ta'ala, which is the Quran. So the Quran is a characteristic and attribute of Allah wa Ta'ala. The reason why we took that one out is because of its like value and how great the Quran is. So the Quran is the speech of Allah and the speech of Allah is a characteristic of his Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shaykh, in this point, if I just interrupt yeah. for a second and mm -hmm. give you another practical example. Yeah, sure. What about the hadith, for example, uh, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Adhib il ba'asa rabban nas, ishfi wa anta shafi, la shifa'a illa shifa'uk shifa'an la yughadiru saqama. Sahih. Here's a perfect example of Allah's names. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Cause the pain to go away, Lord of mankind, <laughs> cure and you are the cure. Mm -hmm. So the name Ar-Rabb is mentioned and the name Ash-Shafi is mentioned. mentioned. There is no cure except your cure, cure that leaves no sickness. Correct. Correct. 
And also the third one being uh, dua and uh, supplication and begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah says in the Quran, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ وَجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِي إِذَا دَعَانٌ Allah is close subhanahu wa ta'ala to his creation and he gives them what they ask for. Uh, so this shows us that these three are what the Arabic term ruqyaf means. And that is why Al-Imam Al-Qarafi, Al-Imam Ibn Hajar, and Nawawi, all three of them, Sheikh mentioned the two, Nawawi and Ibn Hajar, and Qarafi as well, they all mention this, this definition together. Also, the ruqya is to uplift a harm that has afflicted a person. So it is raf'u darar is to remove a harm that has befallen a person. And it's also to, a ruqya can also be to prevent yourself from something that hasn't even happened yet. The scholars, they categorize the ruqya into two types. Sheikh has mentioned it. But out of formality, it's ruqya shar'iya and ruqya shirkiya. So the ruqya shar'iya are the conditions that the Sheikh and Sheikh Muhammad Hafizahullah mentioned. That it's in the Quran, it's in the speech of Allah Taala. It's in clear Arabic. The person doesn't believe that this means itself brings the cure. We don't believe means can cure you. The uh, means are that which we come with, and we leave the results with Allah Azza wa Jalla. And if the person, any of those three, if it's missing, um, then it becomes ruqya um, shirkiya. Naam. I want to go back to Hadith that Ustad Tim you, you mentioned earlier. That was when the companions were on a on a, a journey and they came across a group leader um, and he had been, I think it was a scorpions thing he was afflicted with and they did ruqya on him and he was immediately cured. They went back to the Prophet and he approved of it. There is a context to this Hadith though, isn't there? And the companions were at the time desperate for kind of food, shelter, mm. money. The tribe had refused them shelter. Yeah. Right, that's right. So is this not just an example of Allah helping the companions during this particular time as kind of like a miracle, which we discussed previously in the magic episodes? Why can't we see it as that? Why do we then take it as a general rule that we can use it mm. and anyone else can use so, it? So, i.e., is it not from the karamat of the awliya, like yeah. something which happens in opposition to the norms in order just in order for Allah Azzawajal to help his believing slave at a time of need? Yeah. The problem with that is from multiple angles. And I'm going to mention three angles. The first angle, which I would have a problem with that is, is the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam قَدْ أَصَبْتُمْ In the same hadith, you did the right thing. And his statement, وَمَا يُدَرِيكَ أَنَّهَا رُقْيَ وَهَوْ What made you know that it was a ruqya? He didn't say, وَمَا يُدَرِيكَ أَنَّهَا كَرَامَ مِنْ كَرَامَاتِ الْأَوْلِيَاءِ or Allah Azza wa Jalla or something like that. He said it was a ruqya and he said you did the right thing. So you this qad asabtum means that Abu Sa'id had a choice to make. He made a choice to take a certain set of actions and the choice that he made was the was the correct one. The second problem that I have with this is the other ahadith, including the hadith of Ibn Abbas, uh, which narrates a similar story but from a different set of companions in which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the hadith in Bukhari and others The most deserving thing for which you took a reward is the book of Allah and the hadith of Ulaqa ibn Suhar al-Sarith from his, his nephew narrated it Kharija ibn al-Sadh in which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Kul la amri ma akala man akala bi ruqyatin batil laqad akalta bi ruqyati haq he said that eat from it for what for as for as many for there are people who have eaten with a false ruqya but you have eaten with from a true ruqya and the ahadith in this regard are many then we add to this not only we mentioned the hadith of Aisha in which the Prophet said Ali Jiha treat her with the book of Allah but we also have this hadith in which the Prophet made it general and he said, Man minkum an yanfa Whoever of you, he was asked about ruqya, and he was asked about having prohibited it at a certain time. And we know with regard to ruqya shirkiya that this was something that was present in the time of jahiliyyah. When he was asked about it again, he said, whoever of you is able to benefit your brother, i.e. with ruqya, let him do so. So he opened it up for people to be able to do. And indeed, he set that as an example himself, sallallahu alayhi wa with his family, and indeed with his his own sicknesses, when Aisha radiallahu anha, she would breathe the mu'awwidat over him, except that she would 
blow onto his hand and use his hand to wipe over his body because it was of more baraka than her hand. And the narrations in this are are many and indeed are, are more than we have time to mention. So I think that it's very difficult to frame that as a as a from the karamat al awliya as something that just happened as a one off. Rather, this was a habit of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, and it was a habit of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So, having a look at some of these narrations and taking the theory from them is is fine, but really practically, we know that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did suffer illness because he was a human being, and when he did, he also called a doctor. If ruqya is one, this all-encompassing cure for everything, sickness of the heart, sickness of the body, everything, why not just recite Qur'an over himself? Why did he call a doctor? So let's quote first of all from Bukhari and Muslim, from the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha. She said, كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ إِذَا مَرِضْ إِذَا مَرِضَ أَحَدٌ مِنْ أَهْلِهِ نَفَثَ عَلَيْهِ بِالْمُعَوِّذَاتِ فَلَمَّا مَرِضَ مَرَضَهُ الَّذِي مَاتَ فِي جَعَلْتُ أَنْفُثُ عَلَيْهِ وأمسحه بيد بيد نفسه لأنها كانت أعظم بركة من يدي عائشة رضي الله عنها she said the messenger of Allah if one of his family would become sick he would blow over them with the mu'awwidat and this kana that, that he used to hear this kana here this was his habit that's what kana means right when it comes in the, his habit was to blow over them with the mu'awwidat and when he became sick from his sickness that he died in she said I used to blow over him and I would wipe with his hand because it had more barakah than my hand. So this was a habit of the Prophet ﷺ and his family. And it doesn't negate going to the doctor. There is no issue here because this, as we mentioned, is one of the means by which Allah has given us to seek a cure. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the other means as well through, through medicine and so on. So there is no harm. But here this hadith indicates that it was his habit with his family and with himself wasallam, not to exclude the practice of Ruqya and blowing over himself with the mu'awwidat. So, I mean, Quran even even if I follow up that with a more of a logical argument, I mean, the Quran and Sunnah being the asal, but um, you don't go to the doctors for every type of illness that you have. You go to the pharmacy sometimes, just get a tablet and just use it. That doesn't negate that the doctor can help, and nor does you know you taking the medicine actually from the pharmacy directly negate the. Uh, they don't. They they complement one another. But if I had an all-encompassing cure like you're making Rukhya to be like, that mm. it can cure everything and mm. everything, mm -hmm. I wouldn't really need to go to the pharmacy. I wouldn't need to go to the doctor. I would just sit in my home mm. and do Rukhya. I don't know. I think if you have the concept of tawakkul being fi'l al-asbab, doing the causes that Allah has placed for you while putting your trust in the one who makes those causes into reality actually work, then I don't see why you can't take multiple causes if Allah Azza wa Jalla has placed multiple asbab for your cure, some of them being ruqya shara'iyah and some of them being medicine, why you wouldn't take all the asbab that are available to you in order to seek a cure. And if I'm not mistaken, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala mentioned the benefit of combining between any these things. If I'm not mistaken, I remember a quote from Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala in the benefit of joining between and he taking and Ibn al Qayyim himself was someone who did this. And if you in his book Zad al Ma'ad and in other books, where he brings you benefits that are we would class as medical uh, treatments, prophetic medicine, and so on. And at the same time, he talks about ruqya sharia uh, and so on. So and and the same time du'a and, and so on. So uh, to me, if they're all means for Allah Azza wa Jal to bring you a cure, there's no reason why you can't take all the means that are available to you. Having said that, there's no doubt that there are some things where you are drawn to one particular means over another, for example. Like, for example, typically, if you have a, uh, a headache, uh, for example, you might be drawn to a particular kind of medication that you, you have your ghalabat or ban, your, you, you believe that this is, inshallah, by the permission of Allah, this is going to help me. So you, you, know, you try that first or you take that first, for example. And similarly, there are other illnesses for which you are drawn towards other kinds of cures and other kinds of treatments. But what I feel about Ruqya Shari'ah also is very important to mention is how it demonstrates your relationship with the Qur'an and your tie to the Qur'an and your attachment to the Qur'an and your belief in the Qur'an as the kalam of Allah Azza wa Jal. And uh, I remember a quote from Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala uh, in which he said that the one that the Qur'an is not sufficient for him, may Allah may not make anything sufficient for him. And the one that the Qur'an is not a cure for him, فَلَا شَفَاهُ اللَّهِ May Allah not cure him. If a person doesn't have that attachment to the Qur'an and that belief in the Qur'an and that 
desire to use the Quran as a treatment, then in reality, you know, it, it doesn't. It doesn't. It speaks volumes for for a person's relationship with the Quran. I mean, even uh, two points. Even the statement, the ayah, "وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ يَا رَبِّ إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَهْجُورَةً." Ibn al Qayyim he said, "Hajr al Quran it comes in many different ways." Hajr tilawati wa tadabburihi wa al-amal What does mahjura mean? Like they boycotted the Quran. Hmm. So he mentions that the types of hajr and boycotting of the Quran. And he said, uh, I think he mentioned five types. And in one of them he said, wa hajr istishfa'i bihi. Boycotting uh, the Quran by not looking, seeking cure from it. Now, there's something I want to go to. Uh, you know whether you go for the Quran as your only cure and you only use the Quran as your cure and you abandon the doctors, or whether you only go to the doctors and you don't find you don't look for the Quran as a cure, it doesn't negate that the Quran is a cure. That's the point we want to understand here. Whether you go to the Quran for the only cure or whether you only go to doctors, it's not our point of cont contention. Our question is: Is the Quran a ruqya? Can it cure? You know, someone doesn't want to go to a doctor at all. He just wants to go to the pharmacy. Doesn't negate that the doctor, with the permission of Allah, knows what he's doing and he can help you. You see? And somebody doesn't like going to the pharmacy and just wants to go to a doctor. And so it doesn't negate that the pharmacy, what they supply you with, can also help you. Mm. Now, Thank you. Um, you've brought a number of narrations from your side. There is a narration that often comes in this topic and that is the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he mentioned that 70,000 of his ummah will enter paradise without reckoning and from them are those who don't seek ruqya that's the English translation is that not him indicating that it's not a good thing to do ruqya? You're referring to hadith an Imam Muslim narrated in his sahih I mean, the hadith of Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu and this hadith the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he was speaking about the 70,000 people who were promised or the 70,000 people who are going to come the Day of Judgment. Um, so they're going to enter Jannah without any punishment or without even any reckoning. They're not going to be interrogated or questioned. Just, just enter Jannah. And the Prophet, he didn't say it's Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman or Ali. Um, but what he did is he gave a description of a group of people. And so the Prophet he said, هُمُ الَّذِينَ لَا يَسْتَرْقُونَ وَلَا يَكْتَوُّونَ وَلَا يَتَطَيَّرُونَ وَعَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ So we have in the hadith وَلَا يَسْتَرْقُونَ They don't ask for ruqya. So this hadith shows us that the ruqya, what does it mean not to ask for ruqya? It means that the last portion of the hadith which is وَعَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ Tawakkul means they don't ask for the creation. They don't rely on the creation. Their bond is with Allah Azza wa Jalla. So they do not ask for ruqya means they don't ask a person to do ruqya on them. They stick to do ruqya on themselves. So you can do ruqya on yourself. You don't need to go to... Ah, because وَلَا يَسْتَرْقُونَ استرقاق means a طَالَبُ الرُقْيَ So they don't request anyone to do ruqya on them. So what they do is they rely on Allah Azza wa Jalla and they come with it themselves. They don't put their relying on the creation and they do it um, to, for themselves. Now... Two points that we need to mention here. This hadith does not indicate any way, shape or form that asking for ruqya is haram. That's first, that has, that has to be understood. It doesn't Why? say that. It just takes that person out of the 70,000. That's all it shows. It doesn't say that you're going to be, you're doing haram because we have many textual evidences where the Prophet ﷺ, you know, he himself asked for ruqya or it was done on him ruqya. Does that take him out of the 70,000? Nabi Lai Muhammad is above the 70,000 and he, he's been promised Jannah to Firdaus. But he did that to show the permissibility of it That you can do it And even in the hadith is And we know the key uh, The Prophet Even though it's karaha Like you know who jays Just to burn yourself What's it called? Cautery Qu um, It's a form of medication as well So it doesn't show that it's haram aslan. Only it just shows that if you want to be from 70,000 These are the criteria set for it the second thing I want to mention uh, from the hadith is that um, the relationship between your reliance in Allah wa Taala and Ruqya, when you, which brings us to the conditions that Ibn Hajar and Qarafi and Nawawi were mentioning, which is that you do not depend on the means when you're doing Ruqya. This means doesn't bring about the results. 
even medication that you take, you don't rely on the medication and say, this medication is going to help me. And if it doesn't work, you start getting violent and abusive and angry and stressed. And you know all of these are asbab means. And the goal is in the hands of Allah wa ta'ala. I'll add just by quoting uh, an Imam ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala in Zaz al-Mu'ad, he said, uh, and I just translated, he said, that is because these people will enter paradise without being called to account because of the perfection of their tawheed. Therefore, he described them as people who did not ask others to perform ruqya for them. Hence, he said, and they put their trust in their Lord. Because of their complete trust in their Lord, their contentment with him, their faith in him, their being pleased with him and seeking their needs for him, they do not ask people for anything, be it ruqya or anything else. And they are not influenced by omens and superstitions that could prevent them from doing what they want to do because superstition detracts from and weakens a tawheed. Now, there's one other, just one other point in this hadith which I also feel is, an under, is a misunderstanding, is that there are situations in which asking for ruqya could take a different ruling completely. And that is because of the principle, مَا لَا يَتِمُّ الْوَاجِبُ إِلَّا بِهِ فَهُوَ وَاجِبُ Whatever is needed to fulfill a wajib is in itself wajib. So let's say somebody is afflicted with a, a jinn problem, which is stopping them from praying. And they've tried to read upon themselves, but they haven't been able to do that. And they've waited for someone to come along and offer to read on them, but nobody came along to offer to read on them. So in this case, we tell the person, and many times you see a person say, I say hey, what's the matter? Why you haven't so asked somebody to give you some advice and help and so on? I said, well, I want to be from the 70,000. And yet that person is not, is not able to perform the wajibat because of a problem that they have. So in this case, I think that that their the, the need for asking, so one of the reasons why it's permissible and it's not forbidden to do so. But this comes under the same thing as asking people for anything, as Ibn al-Qayyim said. It's like this habit people have of asking for everything, right? Like even, can you do this for me? Can you help me with this? Can you? That habit of asking people for things, it's not something haram, but it does detract from your tawakkul in Allah when it gets to such a level that you're all the time your your instant response to things and problems is to ask someone else. So the default position is to do ruqya on yourself. Is that the best? That's the best thing to do, to do ruqya on yourself. Or if somebody offers ruqya to be done on you and says, for example, Aisha radiallahu anha, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam became sick, she read on him. She didn't he didn't say, Oh Aisha, will you will you read on me? She simply started to read on him as he used to read on her when she was sick. So that here is an example of that that doesn't exclude you from that group because you didn't ask anyone for sure. here. No. Okay, final topic I want to just uh, um, explore is let's take it now to the modern world. We're in 2019. We have many people doing Rukhia and they're not really interested in curing a patient. It's just to become a business. They charge large amounts of money for and they often like intend to delay the kind of the treatments they get more and more sessions more money out of it what are your thoughts on these kind of practices that are going on in front of us now well i i to be honest i uh, i agree with you that uh, there is a problem among uh, people performing rukia who are not performing it with the correct attributes of the Raqi. Because there are attributes that are deserving to be inside of the person who performs Ruqya for other people. And one of those attributes is uh, sincerity. And one of those attributes is the care for the, the person. Um, and sometimes we see people who are missing those things. Uh, I don't think that means we should, uh, you know, to use the expression, uh, throw the baby out with the bathwater, and that we should be saying to people that Ruqya shouldn't be done. But by encouraging people, and what I've really dedicated my uh, time to in terms of teaching is helping people to do this for themselves and for their families. This reduces the need for people to go to other people, bringing them closer to Allah, bringing them closer to the Quran, making their connection stronger, and inshallah ta'ala, producing better results by the permission of Allah Azawajal. And then on top of that, I mean, there, there, are, there are people and there is a need for people who have a certain speciality in it. And there were among the Sahaba people who were known for Ruqya, who used to do it before, prior to Islam and asked the Prophet some permission after that and they became known for it. And there is a hadith, uh, that the most deserving thing you take in a reward, a reward for is the Book of Allah. 
We don't want to exclude those things, but there are, def there are definitely abuses of the system and we should all be, inshallah ta'ala, trying to prevent these from taking place. And one of the major ways we can do that is by teaching people how to do this simple treatment upon yourself. And one of the things I strongly disagree with is making basic ruqya into this secret science that nobody knows. When I say basic, I'm, not, I'm talking about a person has a fever or something like that, or they're worried about their children, maybe think that maybe they got afflicted by the evil eye with something. This basic thing of just reading the simple, look at what Aisha radiallahu anha did, she read the Mu'awwidat. Which one of us doesn't know the Mu'awwidat? You know, the last three surahs of the Quran, it's very, very easy, you know, just to blow over somebody. I think that the more we educate people to do this, ta'ala, and the more we connect people directly to Allah Azza wa Jal, instead of the system of waiting for so-called experts to come, who, who you rightly said often don't care about the patient and often don't... Uh, perform ruqya in, a, in the right way, in the most honorable and uh, truthful way, there is no doubt that this is something we need to deal with and we need to address by teaching people. I mean, if you look at the, um, the hadith of Sa'id al-Khudri, and you look at it as a, you know, uh, you look at it to ponder over it and actually take benefits and lessons from it, because uh, the answer of your question is actually in there. Abi Sa'id al-Khudri, when the man asked him, uh, who from amongst you can can do ruqya? And Abu Sa'id Khudri said, "Me." First of all, he wasn't a, he wasn't there wasn't like a billboard and a banner where he had so he people come to came to him. That's one thing that the scholars extracted from that. Second thing is that Abu Sa'id Al Khudri put a condition that you're going to give us this much if this man gets cured, which is another thing which a person is taking money. Best based on hourly rate. That needs to be looked at. I'm saying it is in min al nawazil that has now become very common. If the person chooses to give you the money, you alhamdulillah, you don't reject what's being offered to you. But to say, look, my hourly rates are this much, and I take this much because the conditions should be based on um, if you the person gets cured, I want this much. I read Quran on you, and you get better. Give me this much, and you both agree on it, and you get. That's permissible for you. So making it a profession, a profession, like as a profession, and you, I mean, I don't see that fee amali salaf. The salaf made this as their profession, and they, that's one. The second thing I didn't see in the uh, salaf when I read their sirah, and that they didn't, what do you call it, charge based on an ongoing uh, service or an ongoing treatment. They said, this is, give me the much, this much, or it's not going to carry on. So what you do is, when you feel like the person's most dear and need of it, you stop and you say, look, you have to pay this much. So you, you're basically talking to the family members of this patient over price while you can see this person is suffering. And you're saying, no, I'm not going to put that money down in the first on the table or you know, nothing's going to go forward. So you're yeah, right. It, take, it took away a lot, a lot from the, uh, the, the barak and the khayr that this thing could have had. Sheikh Abdul Kamal, final question uh, I'm going to pose to you. Um, as a conclusion to this topic, we mentioned many times that the Quran is a shifa. Oh. Many people, they wear something called a ta'weez or a ta'weez. Where, what exactly is this, first of all, and what is the ruling on using this? Yeah, I'd like to Sheikh Tim to go, handle this. So I'm going to come to Sheikh Tim with another um, question as well. Okay, okay. You see, the issue of the ta'weez is that when you look at the Sahabas, there were two views. Um, a view that did say it was permissible and a view that said that wasn't permissible. Um, and Allah told us in the Quran, If there's a difference of opinion, um, the hukum is with Allah Azza wa Jalla. We have to go back to the Quran and the, have to go to the Quran and the Sunnah. By the way, when we say there's a difference of opinion here, you have to understand that it, they're, they're first saying with these conditions, there's a difference of opinion. So it has to be clear cut Quran. It can be seen by everybody, it can be understood that this is the word of Allah Azza wa Jalla. It's in the Arabic language. Um, it's not gonna be used to go, to go to the toilet or it's not gonna it's not in places of your body where it's bad or filthy or where they put conditions down. Then they differed. They said, Can this be seen as a cure? This is a Quran, the speech of Allah. We say if there's a difference of opinion on an issue like that, we take it back to the Quran and the Sunnah. We don't find it. And the reason why we don't find it is because when the Sahabi came to the Prophet and the Prophet said to him, what is this that's in your hand? 
And he said, إنما هي وهنا. And then he said, إنزعه, take it off. إنه لا يزيدك إلا وهنا. Take it off. It will only increase you in weakness. The scholars, أصول الفقه, they say, ترك الاستفصال في موضع في موضع ترك الاستفصال في موضع الاحتمال ينزل منزلة العموم في الأقوال. ولا ذلك عراقي صاحب المراقي سيس ونزل أن ترك الاستفصال منزلة العموم في الأقوال. The Prophet didn't do istifsal. He didn't question him. What is it that's written on your on your on your ta'wiz? Do you have Quran on there? Do you not have? Is it other than the Quran on there? The fact that the Prophet didn't do istifsal. في موضع الاحتمال at a time when there's a possibility could have been this or that. ينزل منزلة العموم في الأقوال. We make it general. We say all situations wearing ta'wiz un, you know, unconditionally it's incorrect. You can't wear it. It's incorrect. It's not allowed. And you're not allowed to. You know? Now I would only add to that that there is a further concern. And the further concern is that this issue of ta'wiz from the Quran has become a wasila to shirk. And that is because today your average Muslim is not able to distinguish properly between what is from the Quran and what is not from the Quran. So what we see is the person almost universally out of a, out of a thousand people, you know, 995 will tell you this is the Quran that I have around my neck. No one is going to say it's the names of shaitan, it's this, it's that, it's the other. When you open it and look at it, Arabic words are written, say, see, look, it's Quran. But it's just scribbled Arabic words. And when you read those words, you often find Ya Fir'aun, Ya Haman, Ya Iblis, Iblis, Iblis. N- n- names of Shayateen and Shayateen al insul Jinn. You know, all kinds of things in there. Pictures, uh, pyramids, uh, eyes, signs of the devil and so on. But most people, will, when you ask them, why do you have this? They will say some of the Sahaba allowed ta'wi from the Quran. So it's become a means to shirk, a means to shirk. So we say that even if, and I still have a, a big issue with this being allowed by some of the Sahaba because even the narrations in that regard are not very clear from all of them. Yani that uh, Ibn Abi Shayba uh, was one of them in his Musannaf who also uh, negated it from a number of the Sahaba. And some of them it said about them that they put it around their children's neck for teaching, like Abdullah bin Amr ibn al said. There's a lot of questions and queries, but even if we accept that for the sake of argument that the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, some of them allowed ta'weed from the Quran, first of all, there's no way that they allowed the ta'weed that people have today, which are just symbols and signs and numbers and huruf muqatta'a and all wrapped up in a leather pouch and so with knots in the top and all that kind of stuff. And secondly, even if we allowed people to just print a page of the Mus'haf and hold it around their neck, it has become a wasila to shirk, a means for people to, to commit shirk out of their ignorance, not knowing the Arabic language, not knowing the Qur'an properly, not being able to tell the difference between what is Qur'an and what is not Qur'an, and being told by the people giving these things that this is from the Qur'an and you know Aisha used to allow it and Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As used to allow it, so please take it from me. So to me, even if we accept that opinion from them, we would still not allow it because it's become a means and we know the principle of said al-dara'i, of blocking the roads which lead to haram and the roads which lead to shirk. Okay, to conclude the episode, my final question to you, Sheikh Tim, is what is your advice to someone who has been doing ruqya for a particular illness, any time of illness, for a very long time and they continue to do it and the cure hasn't come yet? What is your advice for this kind of person? So I think Ruqya has a lot of parallels with Dua. A lot of parallels with Dua. Uh, and a lot of the things you can say about Dua are true about Ruqya Sharia as well. So I believe that when you have a person who says to you that I've been doing Ruqya for a long time, the first thing you say to them is that this is a very similar statement to a person who says I've been making Dua for a long time. And you say that you uh, you making Dua like that for a long time, it doesn't mean you shouldn't despair or you shouldn't rush and stop doing it. That's the first thing. The second thing is that the person should look at the causes which prevent their dua from being accepted. The things which, like I mentioned in the hadith about the man who was on a long journey, as he raised his hands to the sky and he was dusty and disheveled, he said, my Lord, my Lord, but his food was haram and his was haram and his, his nourishment was haram, his food was haram, his clothing was haram, he was nourished with haram. So these are some of the things also. And the third thing we would advise people to do is we'd advise people to go back through 
the, the reliable books and the reliable videos about Ruqya Shar'iyyah and to look at what they are doing. Because often when they go back to the beginning and look at it again, they will find things that they can improve and things they can change and things they didn't realize before. So many times people think of it only in the sense of, I'm reciting this amount of the Quran every day. But they don't think about their relationship with the Quran, their attachment to it. They don't think about their sincerity. They don't think about their tawbah. They don't think about uh, dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they're just counting on how many pages of the Mus'haf I'm reading and asking Allah for shifa. So we would say again, the third thing in summary would be to go back through the instructions, to go back through the reliable books and videos and to look at where the mistakes might be. Perhaps Allah Azza wa Jalla al-Fattah will open up for them a means for their cure and otherwise to be patient with the afflictions that happen to people. وَبَشِّرِ sabirin. Be pay, give glad tidings to the patient, the people who are patient and the people who bear it for a long time. And look at from the two stories that I think from the most beneficial in this regard is the story of Ayyub alayhi salam because of the patience that he had with the sickness he had. And he said, uh, shaytan wa The shaytan has afflicted me with a portion of torment and punishment. And he was patient. The amount of time that he was patient and turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seeking a cure from Allah uh, and uh, also the dua of or the dua of uh, of the uh, noon of Yunus alayhi salam and when Allah uh, when he said la ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al-dhalimeen and what that entails from tawbah and turning to Allah and Allah said fastajabna lahu wa najaynahu min al-gham wa kathalika nunji al that we answered him and we saved him from his distress and we will save every believer like this, every believer who makes this dua. So turning to Allah in dua, tawbah and other things, as well as really looking at the person's uh, relationship with Allah Azza wa Jal and going back over there, how they've learned what to do. And then if they need to ask advice from someone, inshallah, we hope that asking advice doesn't come under the istirqa that takes somebody out of the 70,000 to go and say, can you give me some advice? Can you give me some ideas about what I can be doing? Inshallah ta'ala, we hope there's no harm in that. So I just wanted to add on two things that the Sheikh uh, kind of already touched on, uh, which is to make it five, inshallah ta'ala. And that is, husnu dhanni billahi azza wa jalla, to think good of Allah tabarak wa ta'ala. Allah mentions to us in the Quran, ذَلِكُمْ ذَنُّكُمْ الَّذِي ظَنَنْتُمْ بِرَبِّكُمْ This is what you thought of your Lord. And Allah tabarak wa ta'ala is... Of Allah is what you think of Him, Subhanahu wa Taala. And in dhanni abdi, I am what my slave thinks of me. Would that be a precise translation? Yeah. Uh, I am uh, with. I am what my slave thinks of me. So you need to think good of Allah Taala. And it's really hard, la shak, to think, you know, happy and good of your Lord at a time when you're feeling down. And the fifth point, I mean, the second point on my behalf to make it five in total, is asking Allah for forgiveness and repenting. Allah says in the ayah, "وَنِ اسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ ثُمَّ تُوبُوا إِلَيْهِ يُمَتِّعُكُمْ مَتَاعًا حَسَنًا." You know, ask your Lord for forgiveness. "وَنِ اسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ ثُمَّ تُوبُوا إِلَيْهِ" and then repent to Him. And some of the scholars, istighfar and tawbah, they make it two different things. Ibn Taymiyyah has a risala on it, qa'ida to fit tawbah, where he speaks about the concept of tawbah and istighfar. What is the difference? We'll speak about that somewhere else. But he's asking Allah for forgiveness and repenting to Him. Subhanahu wa Taala. Allah says, "يُمَتِّعُكُمْ مَتَاعًا حَسَنًا." You'll get a good life. And another ayah, Allah says, مَنْ عَمِلَ صَالِحًا مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٍ فَلَنْ نُحِيَنَّهُ حَيَاتًا طَيِّبًا So if you come with righteous action, male or female, you do good actions, Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, He will give you a good life. And the opposite is when you turn away uh, from your Lord. Uh, you, you, subhanAllah, you actually see people are sick and they're going through illnesses and they still listen to music, still smoking. They're still doing haram, they're still doing ghibah and everything. And then Allah says, وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِ فَإِنَّ لَوْمْ عِيشَةً ضَنْكًا وَنَحْشُرُهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَعْمَى what, what happiness are you waiting for? And what good life are you are you waiting for? And this is, is going to be your illness. is just going to increase and probably get worse and worse and worse. Now. Jazakum Allah khairan for joining me on another episode of The Hot Seat. Jazakum Allah khairan. We hope you benefited from the mini-series we've just released on the world of the unseen. We spoke about the importance of self ruqya in this episode and how it's actually much simpler than many people imagine. I'd like to recommend a video from our Sheikh Muhammad Tim Hanbal on YouTube called A Simple Guide 
to self rukia Just a reminder, if you have any questions about any of the episodes we release on The Hot Seat, you can email us at questions at thehotseatpodcast.com. Until next time, fi amanillahi, wassalamu alaikum, wa rahmatullahi, wa barakatuh.